Hello, everyone. Can you hear me OK? This is Beyond the Blink, add Drupal to your IoT uh, playground. If you're here for something like super serious and you want to have your brain melted, you're in the wrong place. We're going to have some fun today, do something a little different. I know you're all doing very serious things and you're, you know, very serious things, but we're not going to do very serious things in here today. So we're going to have some fun with LEDs and blinking lights and we're going to add the internet in there too and we'll throw in some Drupal at the end, okay? So um, my name is Amber Matz. And you can find me on Drupal.org at Amber Himes Matt. Uh, you can find me on Twitter, especially if you're nice, at Amber Himes Matz. And I am a production manager and trainer for Drupalize Me. And so I make a lot of training videos. I do a lot of Drupal. And sometimes you just don't want to do some Drupal and you want to play with something new. So I just last. Um, Last fall, I started playing with Arduino. I went to a seminar at my library, getting started with Arduino. I had a little starter kit, and I was taking a, I'm sorry that there's tapping, tapping with the, the, the audio. And I got the Arduino ID loaded on my computer, uh, and I started uh, making a light blink, and I was hooked. So when you can start to make lights blink, I don't know, it's just something there's some kind of chemical in your brain that's released and you're like, this is amazing. I have this power now over lights and it just, you know, balloons from there. So today's takeaways, you're going to learn a, a little bit about microcontrollers. And if you don't know what that is, just hold on a minute. What is the Internet of Things? Internet of Things, Internet of Things. Everyone's talking about it. What is it? It's so buzzwordy. What's going on there? And we're going to talk about how can a thing connect to the internet? And why would you want to do that? And how can machines and devices talk to each other over the internet? What Drupal has now for IoT applications and what I'm hoping can be developed in the future? What I think Drupal needs to better serve IoT applications. And I want to preface all of this by saying that when I'm saying IoT and this, my perspective here is very personal. This is my personal journey of learning this and, and this is a very like maker, maker, hacker kind of thing. This is not like, these are prototypes people. This is not like ready for market. This is not, and I, you know, I'm building an iPhone here or anything like that. So this is very DIY oriented and I'm also not talking about getting your content into like you know, Amazon or Alexa or, you know, any of the fancy stuff like that. So I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about things, hardware things, and how we can add internet to it and how you can trigger actions over the internet, make lights blink over the internet, how you can get that data into Drupal. So what is IoT? IoT is the internet of things. You take a thing, you add computational intelligence to it, you connect it to the internet, profit, Maybe you'll probably lose a few bucks along the way, but maybe eventually, I suppose. And it all begins with a blink. So how do you get started with Internet of Things? Well, first you need to know a little something about microcontrollers. And a great place to start is with the Arduino Uno, which is a very uh, easy to use board. I have here a um, no offense intended Chinese knockoff of an Arduino Uno that I got for cheap at my local surplus store. And so I'm going to show you what this looks like. So if I, uh, this is an Arduino Uno, and if I add power to this through the USB, I have a little LED that's wired up here. And um, I've got a resistor uh, going through um, so that the light doesn't explode or anything like that. And this is called, this thing right here, it's called a breadboard. It's got metal strips along each row, so each of the rows are connected. And then along the side here, on both sides, they're connected along the columns. So you can use these little wires here, these are called jumper wires, and you can connect to power and ground. So I have an LED, LED plugged in here, and it's got two pins, a long and a short one. And the long one is called an anode, and the short one is called a cathode. The long one's Plugged in here, we've got a jumper in that same row, and it's going to digital pin 13. So the Arduino here has got a row of digital pins along here, and, uh, and then it's got some analog inputs here. We're going to talk about analog inputs in a second. 
And then with my little jumpers, I've got it connected to ground on the Arduino, and then five volts of power. So an Arduino has five volts of power, and the resistor uh, compresses that down so that, because that's just way too much power for, for a little LED. And this is also a power outlet. I could um, have plugged this into like a nine volt battery with a little cap on the end, and I could be powering this uh, with battery. Um, but it also will use the USB power. So it all started with this circuit. And, um, and then next, um, so through that exercise, I learned about the Arduino Uno, what the, like a very in, a basic introduction to what a microcontroller is, what a breadboard is, I'd never used that before, what an LED, a resistor, some of these electronic terms that I had never heard before. I have no electronics background. I had this like vague awareness of these terms, but these were all new to me. And uh, you know, these different kinds of tools that I can use for prototyping, like these jumper wires. And I learned how to load a sketch, um, connect the Arduino to the USB and load a program onto it. And this just runs continuously. So it's not like a web page where you're changing something and saving and hitting refresh. It's you're changing something, you're loading it onto the Arduino, and then it runs in a loop. So it's great for automated processes, right? Automated systems that are keeping an eye on something, and then when a certain value hits, you know, a sensor is d detecting something, then, um, then something you can make something happen. So, and this USB cable is, you probably recognize from like a, a printer type cable. So that's all it is. You wanna make sure one of the first mistakes I made was um, in this library seminar that I went to, I, I had just a regular charging cable. And, um, and we were like, we just couldn't figure out why the Arduino ID wouldn't detect it. And it was because we had the wrong cable. So you need a nice, good, solid printer cable um, if you wanna do this right. Um, so the second thing I learned was about the analog inputs and a thing called a potentiometer. What's that? Well, so digital input is on or off, right? One or zero. An analog input can have basically uh, an infinite number of inputs and you can set a range and so you can, uh, like think of a dial for example as a good example. So um, I learned about potentiometers and I got one of those wired up. So let's take a look at that. Just move this over here. I'm breaking all the demo rules today. I'm gonna to do live demos with electronics using the internet. <laughs> so, so there. Um, okay, so what we have here is uh, another little circuit. It's a very basic circuit. This is circuit number two in my getting started booklet, right? So, um, and we've got same thing, LED is blinking, right? But oh, what's this over here? This is called a potentiometer, and it's a little dial, and I'm gonna turn the dial, and I'm gonna turn a little more. There we go. Now the light's blinking faster. So I can control, and now it's blinking so fast it's dim. It's hard to see on the video. But so I can turn the dial and it changes the rate of the blinking. So, hey, that's pretty cool. So now I know about a little bit about microcontrollers and I know about this thing called a potentiometer. And now I can understand this tutorial that says, oh, did you know that you can sew microcontrollers onto fabric and you can use conductive thread? And, um, and there's these, these other kinds of uh, microcontrollers that you can use that, um, are Arduino compatible, so I can use this Arduino IDE that I, I really like, and I can add a board to it, and I, can, I learned about these things called digital inputs, and oh, I, I can read these little NeoPixel pads, and I can kind of understand what's going on, and I understand about power and ground and ins and outs, and so I can sew this hoodie, and I can, um, I can put this hoodie on, and I can have this, uh, this is a soft potentiometer, it's a textile potentiometer. And it's not a dial, but it's doing the same thing. It's measuring the length here. And so I'm starting, and my range is like RGB values, right? So we're gonna start with blue, and it's a little glitchy because I sewed it. And, um, <laughs> and then we can just go, and then here we go, here's red. So I went from red, the whole spectrum. So I'll put that under the video too so that folks at home can see it. 
But just by learning these concepts, I'm just building on my knowledge and able to do other things. So I'll just show this for the sake of the folks at home. Here's the uh, Gemma microcontroller. And um, this is just a very, it's, it's the little sister of this, this one. This is a Flora. And this is a much more, uh, this is more akin to the Arduino Uno in terms of power and, and things like that and what it can do. But this is the little, the little one. And this is a Gemma. And so I've just sewn the circuits and then we've got the NeoPixels here that are chained together. These are actually individually addressable, but in my code, I'm just addressing them all at once. So I still haven't got to the internet yet, but I'm learning lots of really cool things, right? So um, sorry about the, do I need to move this maybe? I'll try that. Can you still hear me OK? OK. OK, and so, um, so now I've learned about the, um, you know, some different analog inputs, and I've even made a wearable electronics project, which I think is pretty cool. And so now I'm like, OK, I'm getting the, the hang of this thing, uh, what microcontrollers are. And let me tell you, I've only scratched the surface because there are hundreds of microcontrollers. And they all do different things, and they're different sizes, and they, they have different kinds of inputs, and they're great for different kinds of projects. So if you're making a robot, you might want to have one kind of microcontroller. If you want to do a wearable project, then you probably want to have something like, you know, like the, oh, there's no camera here, but you want to have something like the Flora here, where you can, um, you can sew, and these pads have holes in them, and it's, you can get a needle and thread through there and you use conductive thread, and you can have a, an, you know, an electronics project. So it just depends on what you want to do. And um, so Arduino, what is Arduino? Like, I, I've been hearing this about, about this a lot, and there's several different things that it is. So it's this IDE, this is this program that you can load code onto boards. It's these Arduino boards, and like the Arduino compatible. And Arduino compatible means you can use the Arduino IDE to load code onto your board. It's also um, a, a bunch of libraries of code. So there's tons of, of contributed code, and also libraries that are part of the, um, the IDE that are embedded in there that you can make use of. It's a community of people. There are tons of tutorials out there and instructables and code and libraries that's been contributed back. It's open hardware and open source. So this idea of open hardware, these, uh, these makers of boards, they are, you know, you go to add that to your cart, you can look at the documentation for it, and they'll have a schematic that you can download. You can download that, open that in CAD. You can tweak it, make your own board, print out your own board. You know, this is open hardware. So it's not free, as in beer, open hardware, because there's a real cost to producing these boards. But it is open, and you can find the schematics for any of these boards um, online, more or less, and, um, and you, could, you could make your own. Um, great for automated systems, um, Arduino, because you've got two basic functions just to get started. You've got a setup function that runs once, and you would set, like, for the LED, I would set the pin 13, which is what I've got it connected to, as an output. So I would put that in my, my setup. And then in my loop, I, that's when I would say, okay, digital pin 13, go high, delay for a second, then go low. And that's what makes it blink. And so the loop just keeps running. And so that's what makes it great for automated sy systems. The Arduino is also great for attaching sensors to. It's very resilient. It's hard to fry an Arduino board. So if you're new to electronics, it's very beginner friendly. That's why I ended up um, connecting, and I'll get to this in a minute, but this 12 volt tower light to the Arduino instead of directly to the Raspberry Pi, because the Raspberry Pi is a little more delicate. It's 3.3 volts, and if you mess it up somehow, then you've like toasted your com little computer, you know. And the Arduino is a lot cheaper, and, um, and it's, it's harder to, you can, but it's harder to. <laughs> um, and it's um, also um, very scalable, so this whole, uh, system, it, it's very component oriented. And, um, and all of these things are very scalable. You can start with any number of things, and then you can add these things called shields. So here's an example of a shield, a glary shield. 
So this one, it, 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 it'll uh, go on top of the Arduino Uno, and it's an SD card shield. So I can add, let's say I'm doing a logging, part, like I, I'm, Got my Arduino doing some logging, and I need space to like keep my logs, you know. And so this is this is a, an example of that. Here's another example. This is um, an XB. It, this is a radio. So let's say I've got a cornfield, and I want to monitor the soil moisture levels, um, but I need to like transmit that data over radio to something else that's connected to the internet that's sending that data to the cloud or to my computer or something like that. So if you need to like get data wirelessly over a distance, you still have line of sight, then radio is a good way to go. Or maybe you've got something in the attic and you just like, it's monitoring, I don't know, smoke in the attic or something like that. And you just like don't want to go up there all the time <laughs> to like download the data. So maybe you just use a radio shield so that you don't have to. Um, so it's scalable in terms of shields and um, attaching sensors and actuators. So an actuator, you know, is like this uh, potentiometer, the dial. All right. So, oh, here's an example of the, here's a screen of the Arduino IDE. Very simple interface, right? We're not talking PHP Storm here, people. So there's like two buttons that I push all the time. Verify and upload, and I don't even have to time press the verify button. I just hit the upload and wait for the errors to come up. And um, so you plug that that thing in. You pick your board. You pick your port, um, and which is like your USB port. And you you, you know you read the error messages, or it, it's successful, and that's it. That's all there is to it. Um, now, other kinds of microcontrollers that you might be hearing about a lot is the Raspberry Pi. So. The Raspberry Pi, I've got one here, and I've got one here. Here we go. Um, and this is a single board Linux computer. It's got, um, it's got lots of USB, um, and it, it's got four USBs, an Ethernet, it's got HDMI. So I've got it connected right here to this is just a TV through an HDMI input. And um, it's got a little audio thing. It's got other, other things in here too. but. It's also got this row of GPIO pens, so you can, uh, which is GPIO is like general purpose in out. It's the same idea as the Arduino. You know, you can connect, um, you know, you can make lights blink and you can run robots with the Raspberry Pi as well. Um, the nice thing about the Raspberry Pi in regards to the Internet of Things is that it's got onboard Wi Fi, right? So it's a, a way. Well, this, this is a Raspberry Pi 2. It's really, it's, it's fairly trivial to get Wi-Fi going. You get a, US, a Wi-Fi USB dongle, and you can get that running pretty quickly. If you've got the right drivers, you download drivers. and OK, maybe it's not trivial, but it's totally doable. <laughs> and then, um, but the, the Raspberry Pi 3, which I have over here, it has built-in Wi-Fi. So the very latest version does have that, and it makes it a lot easier to get connected. It's just less, less wires. Um, so I'll show a little. Um, here's the close-up of that, complete with glare. Oh boy. Okay, you can sort of see that. So you know, when you get one of these, you instantly feel like a bona fide nerd, and you're just like, I'm legit now, because I'm like looking at this, you know, microcontroller board, and I know what the word microcontroller means now, and. You know, this thing is running Linux. You just feel pretty cool. You know, it's, it's pretty cool. And actually, the, the interface for it, the operating system, if, if there's a, there's, this is, um, the operating system is loaded on a little micro SD card. So you get the operating system on there, and there's a version called Noobs. And um, it just gets you up and running with a graphical user interface, and it's great. So. Um, the hardest thing about these things is like what to do with them. Like a lot of people have these things lying around and they're like, okay, what do we do with this? So that's the hardest thing to get started. Maybe you'll, you'll get some ideas today. Um, okay, let's continue. So with the Raspberry Pi being so easily able to connect to the internet, like okay, let's have some fun here. And the first thing I needed to consider was, OK, I want to make this tower light blink. Um, how, how do I want to do that? Does my Raspberry Pi need to know, like, how 
Does it need to get connected? Does, do they, they really need to know about each other? Like, in what terms? And so, and I have a Jenkins build. So what I have here is um, I have a Drupal site, um, which is kind of cons just inconsequential. It's just, that's just there. And the Jenkins build is running cron um, on the Drupal site. So that's the only, Drupal is just there for fun. And, um, and then the Jenkins build is sending a curl command with a post, an HTTP post with a JSON and it's saying I've started the job or the job is successful or it's failed and it's sending those values to an API a cloud-based API called Adafruit IO and this is great for you set up a feed and you can send your sensor data there or any kind of data you want like one value at a time and so that's I've got this feed set up on Adafruit IO called build status so the started, success, or failed values are going to that API. Now, meanwhile, I have the Raspberry Pi, and it is running a Python script that is using a protocol called MQTT, and it's keeping the connection open to Adafruit IO. And it's listening for started, success, or failed. And when it sees one of those, then when it started, it'll, the yellow light will turn on. It would have been so great, because it's running like every 30 minutes, if I had touched this and it would have gone on right now, that would have been pretty sweet. Um, but it didn't happen. <laughs> um, so the yellow light goes on when it starts, and then the green light goes on when it's successful, and if it fails, the red light goes on. So let's see if we can um, get uh, but the Jenkins, what I'm, the point I'm trying to make is the Jenkins build doesn't know anything about this thing. It's, it doesn't know its IP address. It's not directly connected. It's, it, doesn't, it doesn't care about it. Th these are decoupled systems. Um, it's all connected through this feed, uh, this API. Okay, so um, let's see if we can get it working. Um, so I've got a Jenkins build here, and I'm just going to start it. And you're all off the internet, right? You're not using the internet right now. So, did, you know, I know you're on the internet because it's not working. So, <laughs> so we'll see if it decides to work. But it's really, it works great at home. I just wanted to tell you that. Um, and, yeah. So anyway, it, this is running every 30 minutes or so. Maybe in the middle of the presentation, it'll start working again. So we'll, we'll just see what happens there. Um, but this is going to run, and oh, it failed. Everything failed. OK, let me try something really quick here. OK, let's try again. OK. I'm going to make sure that my script is running over here. I'm just going to, oh yeah, it's going, it's going, it's going. It's going. OK, and then I'm going to run the build again. Aha, and look, there's a yellow light. Yes, OK. Thank you, thank you. OK, oh, and it's successful. Oh. Wow, you know, this is, I just want to thank my, no, okay, so, <laughs> great. So let's, let's do the, um, the failed, so let's make it fail. I'm going to configure this, and if I can use drop downs, okay. And so I'm just going to add a, a build step here, and I'm just going to put some gibberish in there and save. This build is now officially uh, not going to work. And I'm going to wait. This will go off in like 30 seconds. I'm just going to give it a minute here. Let's just see if it works. Bill now. I think the wires, the streams are going to cross here a little bit because this isn't done yet. Um, this might take a second. So. I'm going to come back to, oh, oh, there we go. It failed. Okay, it failed. Yay, okay. The, the point that I'm not making very well, but when you're on a reliable network, <laughs> um, these 
sending things to these feeds and using MQTT is actually pretty instant. And when you're on a reliable network, even though these things aren't directly connected to one another, you can use this API and it's near instant. And that's what's cool about it. And I'm not using HTTP polling or anything like that. I'm using this protocol that I'm gonna explain later called MQTT. And it's, it's, you can effectively use a third party broker and send messages between devices without them knowing about each other. And this is great because it, there's also this like security thing that is there, right? Like if, you know, if, if, if you have a thing that's insecure, but it's directly connected to something that's like a critical system, like your build, then, um, you know, you don't want to expose your critical system through a, an internet thing, you know? So don't have them t talk to each other, have them talk to a broker and send past messages that way. So now I'm just gonna um, uh, get this working again. I'm gonna go back into that build step that I added and delete that, save it, and um, let's just, hey, it works again, okay, woohoo. So, um, so that's the, my first example of an internet thing using the Raspberry Pi and using Adafruit IO. And it, that was just, um, I can think, that was, a, the things that I learned there were, I learned a little bit of Python. I learned how to tin the ends of these wires because it was stranded wire. Man, I tell you, oh, things I had to learn. So I learned to solder for you all. I just want you to know that. Um, so, oh, I should show you this. So I'll show you this, um, this circuit here. Huh. Okay, I'm gonna move this all over. I know this is a little dog and pony show-ish. I hope that's okay. Okay, so this, this thing, okay, I know that's, can you see that okay? That's okay, right? So um, this thing is connected via USB to the Raspberry Pi. And there's, in the Python script, it's actually calling like, okay, uh, GPIO pin three, five, and seven, you know, it's actually calling the, the Arduino pins. So I've got some libraries installed that enables that to happen so that the Raspberry Pi can talk to the Arduino. That's really great because um, this is a 12 volt device, this, this tower light, and this Arduino is five volts, and they need a way to wire these up without fire. And so um, there's, there's a couple things. These things right here, these are called MOSFETs. And they, um, they absorb the extra energy. And then I've got some resistors in there too. So there's, um, there's a way, what I'm saying is like 12 volt to five volt, you know, there's a way to like uh, reconcile those differences so you don't have a fire or, or ruin your stuff. So that's how, that's how this worked. And the reason why I did it this way um, was because when I tested the tower light, I was more comfortable testing it on, on, on Arduino than I was on the Raspberry Pi. The Raspberry Pi was like brand new to me and I was a lot more comfortable with the Arduino. And then I didn't want to touch it. I was like, it's working. I don't want to like touch it. And so I researched how to get the Raspberry Pi uh, to control things on the Arduino. So thank you Raspberry Pi cookbook um, for that. Okay, so let's move on. Um, so you want an internet thing. Um, why, why do you want this? You know, like, there's a lot of pain. I just want you to know that there's some sadness involved with adding the internet to your things. As you all know, as web developers, you know, there's a certain amount of frustration involved. And it's like pure joy when it's like you're working in an embedded system and you're making things working and then all of a sudden you add the internet to that. I just want to let you know that it can be painful, my friends. But there are some good reasons to connect your thing to the internet. Your device has data on it and you want it, and you want it now, and you don't want to plug it into something. And, or your device is far away, and you want that data, you want access to it. Um, or your device needs data from elsewhere to do its thing. Um, or you have two or more devices and they need to talk to each other or you want to trigger something on that device remotely. So there's all sorts of things, like maybe you want to say, okay, when I'm, um, when I'm a, like a block away from my, my house, 
I want my house to detect the fact that I am like on my way home because of GPS things and and to automatically open the garage door. Nothing bad can go wrong in this situation, right? <laughs> and um, and it will just you know happen by magic. And so those are the kinds of things like you can do with sensors and and data, and you can trigger things. Um, and in that case, the, the internet would be connecting through cellular, right, in the car. And, but at home, the, th the thing that is actually opening the door is connected to the home Wi-Fi. So you use different modes depending on your context. So let's talk about, oh, reasons not to connect your thing to the internet. You think it will be so easy. Everyone's doing it. Internet of things, internet of things, so easy. Okay, if you want easy, go buy a phone, a smartphone, and just be done you know and just don't go there but if if you are up for a little challenge you know and you like to read tutorials that are probably a little bit wrong um, then you know you should go for it um, also if you loathe code like if you just don't like it at all don't do this at all um, also if you hate learning new things you just don't like learning at all like yes yeah, I'm gonna like celebrate every time this light goes on. Um, thank you, build notifier, tower light. If you hate learning new things, you should not go down this road at all. Just like get, go to the Best Buy or the store and just get the thing that's already working, okay? So there are some specific uh, data needs in the IoT space. So there's storage, okay? Like what, storage for your data, storage for your program, you start like, putting things together, uh, hooking things up to a microcontroller. This is, I'm telling you the story of the death of Thing 2. So, in Thing 2, I had this, this Flora microcontroller. Turns out, the Flora microcontroller only has a, a, little, a limited number of space. I added to it a BMP280 barometric pressure and temperature sensor. I added to it an LED matrix. It was this little guy, it was so cute, it was great. I love LED matrix matrices. And uh, I also added to it a GPS module and a blue fruit module which connects it to Bluetooth. Turns out, for each of those components you have to add a library of code. And that code takes up space. And when I added, I tested each of these things one at a time. I kept adding to them. And I'm like, this is going really great. I'm going to rock this. And then I added the Bluetooth, uh, the Blue Fruit module and the library. And all of a sudden, I'm at 114% of my storage space. And um, I spent all day, one Sunday, trying to optimize that code. I got it down to 101%. I could get it down to 99% with just the library loaded. When I added the one line to make the one call um, to the blue, it, it went over to 101%. So, um, so thing three was born. So thing three, um, well, let me just go through this first. Um, so you need storage. Uh, um, sensor data is great for visualization, so you're sending all these values, it's great for maps and charts and graphs, and so if you're into data visualization, you should like check out things that are happening in the IoT um, sensor data world, it's fascinating. There's monitors and triggers, so you know, it's like, yeah, it's fine and good that we have all this data, but what are we going to do with it? And um, uh, and then we've got calculations that need to run and updatability. And there's different ways that you can connect. You can, you can use Wi-Fi, you can use cellular, you can use Ethernet. You can, you can um, kind of do like a leapfrog method and like connect to something that's connected to the internet, right? So you could use Bluetooth or you could use uh, radio for that. And uh, you need to consider like how accessible does your data need to be? How often do you need access to this data? Do you need access to it every, every second? Like is this a smoke alarm trigger? Like, do you need access, you know, like, do you need the notification that your house is filled with smoke, like, when your website decides to run cron three hours later? Or do you need it now? Like, do you need to know instantly? So how instantly do you need this access? What other things um, uh, need your device's data to trigger their action? So, like, what's the chain of events here? What's the timeliness? If you're just getting today's forecast, is once a day enough? Yeah, it probably is. Um, and how will other machines access your data? How will other humans access your data? Are you going to really like expect uh, you know your, your someone else that needs this data to like 
load it up uh, to Arduino IDE and open up the serial monitor and just like get the raw data and then convert it. No big deal, right? You know, no, like how are they going to get that data? How are the humans going to access that data? That's an important consideration. So IoT cloud APIs are there for this reason. You can store sensor data for free. There's um, hosted REST API endpoints so that you can get that data, you can do CRUD operations on it, you can create new data, you can update or delete that data, and you can use um, message brokers that are just, there's so many options, and you can use protocols like MQTT to distribute the data as you require. Um, ThinkSpeak is one example of a great API. It's an open source API. You can actually like download ThinkSpeak from GitHub, but it's hosted on the internet, thinkspeak.com. You can store data in channels. It's got a REST API for each of your channels and um, data import and export. export. You, can, um, you can set up MATLAB analysis. So you can do calculations on your data. They've got a lot of like out of the box MATLAB, like boilerplate code that you can just modify a little bit and then you can get some great you know, calculations and visualizations out of that. They've got different plugins for gauges and charts, and you can add your own custom thing as well. And they've got actions and triggers. Um, Adafruit IO, I'm a real fan of um, Adafruit, and um, I, I like to support their business. Um, and uh, they have a lot of great support, not only in their products, but in their code libraries. And they have this service called Adafruit IO, which is in beta right now, but it's working great for me. You can store, you store the data in feeds, so um, one, feed, you know, one feed per one you know, channel. You're not gonna, um, not like in Drupal where you have like multiple fields, like in a content type or something like that, but this is like one feed of uh, data, you know, one channel. They've got visual, data visual, visualization widgets, um, feed data manipulation tools, device control. So you can trigger, you can set up a little widget on there to like an on off switch and you can you know, turn a light on, on and off from the website. So you don't even have to code your own thing. You can use their API and their, um, their tools, their widgets to, to con get a, a start in all of this. It integrates with if the, the blah, 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 if this, then that, I-F-T-T-T, and, um, and there's lots of uh, code libraries with helper functions to help you connect if you're a developer. Um, so the first context I want to talk about is uh, on the go, is, is thing one, you know, away from a controlled access point. So let's say I'm on the go, but I've got my phone with me. So can I use my phone's internet connection which is connected over cellular to get data from my thing up to the internet? The answer is yes, I can. I will show you now. Okay, so let's look at thing. I don't know what number we're on now. This might be thing five. Okay, here's my thing. Here we go. Okay, so this thing is, uh, this is a, Feather Blue Fruit M0 microcontroller. It's real nerdy stuff here, folks. So the stuff that is like easy to use and um, has really lots of great support is usually out of stock. The stuff that you can get on short notice when you have a DrupalCon presentation is really um, easy to get and it's also a little harder to use. Um, so not all the Arduino libraries work as good, which is why it's just doing this thing here. So this is what I could figure out. So I've got a BMP280 uh, barometric pressure and temper temperature sensor. It's connected to the blue fruit. Now, observe, on my phone, I'm gonna move this out of the way. I have an app on my phone uh, provided by Adafruit in the app store called Blue Fruit LE. So I'm gonna open that up and here's my device. I'm going to connect to it over UART, which is a hardware serial thing. And uh, here's, you can tell I'm just learning all this stuff, right? And it's okay, because you can be a beginner and you can get some stuff working that you didn't think you could ever get working. So here it goes. Like, it's reading the temperature in the room and it's um, sending that data up. And I've got the MQTT uh, stuff, it, it's configured to go to this temp, temp C, thing three temp C feed. 
So if I go to Adafruit I.O. and I go to my feeds, um, here's the, the temp C, thing three, temp C. I guess this is thing three. So half a minute ago. So it's, I'm sending, so now I could do something with this data. I don't know what I would do, but you know, I could do something with it. So it's, it's, it's in there, it's accessible to me. It's accessible to another machine over this API, and accessible to me as a human through this lovely web page. Okay, so ta-da. Okay, next. Um, you can also connect over Wi-Fi. So we've got Wi-Fi here, and um, I've got this little thing. This is, um, okay, see that okay? So this is another feather board. This is a wicked feather. See, I learned how to solder for you people. I just want you to know that, I appreciate that. So uh, this is a, a wicked feather microcontroller that you can't really see because on top of it is this feather wing. It's an OLED, it's got this OLED display here. And do you see that? Today's high, 85 degrees. So how did that get there? I'll tell you. So um, if this, then that, uh, in fact, I'll show you right here. If this, then that, every day at 7 a.m. is getting the weather forecast and it's sending the data to this Adafruit I.O. feed called high temp. The script on the feather is uh, calling to that uh, Adafruit I.O. and getting, getting the high temperature. It's connecting to the Wi-Fi. I have it configured to connect to my personal hotspot on my phone because I don't trust this internet here. And, but it could connect to any, you, you configure the SSID and the, the password in, in the code and, and it connects to the, the Wi-Fi. So that's another way you can do it. Um, so I'm pretty sure I need to talk a little bit faster now. Oh yeah, I'm gonna skip to, what about Drupal? You all came here for that, right? <laughs> so, um, okay, so what Drupal has now is uh, Guzzle, which is a way to make HTTP requests and, and handle responses, a vendor directory, which means, and by that I mean like anything on packages and these crazy PHP stuff that people are doing could be conceivably ported into Drupal 8 and there's also the ability to integrate JavaScript and embed, you know, Node.js. And I would also add there's a lot of smart people in this Drupal community. So that's what Drupal has now. So what I did with that was um, I made a Drupal site that um, it is getting, this thing speak has a channel that tracks the location of the largest container ship in the world called the, Ma the Mary Maersk. And on the Mary Maersk is a location sensor and it sends the latitude and longitude to thing speak and I'm getting that data using Guzzle in a custom module in Drupal 8 to uh, get the latitude and longitude. And um, I've created this leaflet map and this leaflet map is getting data um, because I created a view of um, Geofield actually works in Drupal 8. Thank you, Geofield people. And um, I uh, have nodes that have a Geofield on them, and these nodes contain the latitude and longitude. I have a view of a REST endpoint using a GeoJSON formatter, and so that, geo, that, that creates a, an endpoint that outputs GeoJSON data, and then a leaflet can use that and, and create these map, uh, these map points. And then I've got this little form here, update ThingSpeak data. So now it's gone out to ThingSpeak, and um, I'm gonna zoom this map out a little bit, and you can see the Mary Marisk is on the move, folks, and we've got the latest data. So that's one way, it's, a, it's admittedly a contrived example of what you can do. There's many ways to improve the situation, like, um, making this more dynamic, having that data updated on a more automated basis, like I could put this into cron or something like that. Um, I could have the nodes be, you know, updated. So it's, it's only creating data with new, uh, it's not creating duplicate nodes. There's many areas of improvement here. But what we've done is we've got sensor data stored in API and we've used Drupal to, to pull that data down. And what I'm currently using is, is Guzzle for that um, in a nutshell. Um, 
Um, so, in my opinion, uh, Drupal has good ways of um, exposing your Drupal site as an API, but it needs better ways to consume data from, from endpoints. And um, Drupal needs both code tools and UI tools to um, let people play with their sensor data and, and with these APIs and connect to these APIs. So I think that a good start would be like an integration module with ThingSpeak or an integration module with Adafruit IO. And there's other IoT cloud-based cloud APIs out there. And I think it would be, I would love to see some development in these areas and maybe I'll, I'll I'll venture into that, but but I'm probably not the best person for that, you know. So um, and also Drupal needs modules that can handle frequent updates. So if you've got data that's that's getting uh, pumped up into an API every second or every five seconds or whatever it is, and it's critical data, then you need um, something that goes beyond polling, right? So you, you don't want a program that's just going to say, hey, is anything new? Is anything new? Is anything new? You need something that's going to be able to keep a, a channel open. And, and I'm not even talking about like making a light blink over, or, uh, over a website, which you can do like using H, uh, HTML5 web sockets and, and MQTT. And there's other ways of doing that. But what I'm just talking about is making use of like real-time data that's in an API. And so I'd really like to see something that goes beyond um, REST um, for that. So um, in Drupal 7, we had feeds, and there were some promising plugins there, like with um, PubSub, Hubbub integration. But that module seems to um, not be on any kind of path to be upgraded to Drupal 8. And so um, I think there's going to be a real gap. There's a real need here in Drupal 8, in my opinion, um, to, to have some of this development that lets people make use of this IoT data. Um, in brief, um, I'm going to make this really quick. I want to tell you about MQTT. So let's say you've got a thing that wants to connect to the internet. And so let's say we have a toaster and we want to connect to it. Well, I suppose we could plug in an Ethernet, you know, with Ethernet to your network and somehow. And, and then it would, you know, connect to the internet. But maybe you need to do it wirelessly. You know, wireless is so cool and everything. So maybe you like attached a Wi-Fi module to it so that it, it detects it. And, you know, um, you know, we've got some, and you figure out the power situation. And, like, if you use REST for this toaster thing, like, the, the HTTP REST thing is going to be like, is there anything new for me? No. Well, what about now? No. What about now? Oh, yes. You know, and this could go on for days, weeks, hours, you know, <laughs> like, who knows? Like, that's so resource intensive. Um, that it's just not a, a very, you know, good way of doing things. So if you have MQTT, um, the, the, bro the cloud API says, hey, toaster, start toasting. Okay, my temperature, and it's like sending out its temperature. Okay, my temperature is 50 degrees Celsius, and it's 100 degrees. Okay, and it's just like sending it along, and it's not, and it's sending it to the MQTT server. And then when it gets to a certain point, the server knows which point that is, and it says, OK, stop. And then it stops, and it sends the message back. And there's this open connection, and there's this publish, subscribe dance that's going on. And when you set the values, and then it, it, you know, there's communication that happens there. And it's low bandwidth and low energy. Um, so this is, this is a really nice thing. This is what I use in Python. There's libraries for it in Python. There's libraries for it in many languages. There's even libraries for it in PHP. There's just not a class for it in Drupal 8 at the moment, um, and it, which it could be brought in, right? So IoT data is special. IoT data uses sensor data a lot. And you know if you're going to monitor sensor data, you need to you're, you're probably going to trigger some action. And so why trigger an action if it's going to be too late? So you need reliable connections. And um, you, know, you can't be relying on running cron unless all you're doing is getting today's forecast, right? If you're using critical sensor data, then you need something that's more reliable. Um, and so I've got some resources here for learning more about MQTT. This was a new to me, and it's new to a lot of people that I've talked to. Um, and so, like with an MQTT broker, you know, you could be juggling multiple things. So there's a location sensor in the car that's like, okay, I'm five miles from home. Start toasting, toaster, and you know, the the toaster starts toasting, and then 
Um, it's, the broker sends a message to your phone saying, your toast is toasting, and you're excited about that. And, and then um, the toaster talks to the broker and says, hey, I started toasting, and you know, it's going to message back and forth about that. And the broker is just handling that all. And each individual script is just going to like, take the data that it needs, not everything, right? It's just like, I just care about this bit of it. And, and then that, that's the way you can juggle these multiple uh, channels and these multiple triggers is through using an MQTT broker. Um, all these slides, um, I asked permission uh, from Adafruit and um, there's a great article on adafruit.com um, on why you would use MQTT and I, I use those graphics and it's all there. There's also a great uh, five or six part series on MQTT essentials that I highly recommend on the hivemq.com site. So I would recommend those as well. Um, I think I'm out of time here um, and I think I, I touched on some of the gotchas that I encountered with regards to storage limits and you know, these different microcontrollers, there's so many different options, and a lot of times you just don't know what you're gonna run into until you plug it in and start working on it. And so just, you know, when I first got into this, I thought, this is gonna be a really cheap way to do fun things, and it's not cheap, folks. <laughs> so, um, you know, it, especially if you, and if you can find someone that can help you along, that's really great. Like, I kind of like forged ahead and was, you know, I had some online resources, but I didn't really, you know, I had the local um, electronic shop that helped, you know, gave me some tips for when I ruined my f thing too and had to desolder it. I had to learn to desolder for you people too. I just want you to know that. And I just want to take a moment to say RIP for thing two. Sorry, or thing two, I couldn't get you connected to the internet, but you were pretty rad. And I just want to take a moment of silence for thing two. Um, so before you add internet to a thing, consider the following. How will you connect? What kind of microcontroller do you need? Like, wh how are you going to embed it? Um, what, you know, what size does it need to be? How are you going to, are you going to have to like learn 3D printing too and 3D print some like crazy case? Probably. Um, can you actually uh, get it? Is it in stock? Who knows, right? And what will you do with the data? You, you know, what API you're going to use, what's going to work best for you. Um, for Drupal, Drupal has some great ways of exposing an API but needs better ways of consuming APIs in order for sensor data to be really, like, usable in a Drupal context. And I think, please, someone add an MQTT class to Drupal 8. That would make me a very happy person. Um, if you would like to evaluate this crazy dog and pony show of a session, I would really appreciate it. And you can go to the session on the DrupalCon website and you can find the evaluation form there as well as the slides. Thank you very much. I, I think we have a few minutes for some questions um, and there's a mic up here. If anyone, or you can shout it out and I can repeat the questions. Are there any questions? Like, do I need a therapist or, you know? I'm just kidding, a little bit. The MQTT, is that like open, open source? Oh, or yeah. is it like mm -hmm. it's? It's a protocol. So it's a protocol like HTTP is a protocol. And so you can implement it. There's, you know, standards. And I didn't go into the details of that at all. But you can read all about the protocol and you can implement it in code in whatever language you want. Node, JavaScript, Python, PHP, whatever. So basically you're setting up like a, a, a quality of service like, okay, how open does this connection need to be? Like, can I close it ever or not? You know, and you can, you can set parameters on, you know, how to keep that open or not, and then you can implement it. So, and there are some great examples um, in GitHub and, you know, just elsewhere um, for how to implement that. I discovered it because a lot of the libraries that I use from Adafruit use it. And so that, I just was using it because these are the examples that I got. And I'm like, oh, this is pretty cool. So, any other questions? Great. Oh, yes, in the back. Uh, are there any already uh, contributions to Drupal that you just have Okay, so I'm going to warn you about some things. Yes, there are, and you should be wary of a couple of things here. <laughs> so, um, some of the examples that I saw were like, okay, how do I turn on a light 
like, how do I make a light blink with Drupal? And it involved, um, and maybe I do mean a little bit of offense to the person that wrote this, but um, it, it involved putting a PHP exec statement into the body field and using the PHP filter. And I do not approve. <laughs> so um, I, I, I think that that's a terrible idea. And I think what you should do is send data to a cloud API and then get that data from the API. And, and it's near real time. There's absolutely no reason to directly like interact with the hardware over the server in the body field of your Drupal site. Please don't do that. So, um, uh, so I couldn't find very many examples, which is why I ended up coding my own module using Guzzle. So, and thank you, thank you to my coworkers for helping me with that. Thanks, guys. Will, Joe, and Blake. Triple eyes me. So. <laughs> yeah, like, um, it would be nice to have a class in Drupal 8 that I could extend or, you know, an interface that I could implement that, um, that would give me some help there so that I wouldn't have to do it. You know, someone who, who understood a little bit more about the protocol. So that's what I'm looking for. And then, you know, and that's just from a developer's perspective. That would be a great start. And then we could add, a, a, you, you know, UI stuff on top of that. But to start with, like, it would just be nice um, to have a class. Um, I did notice in the vendor directory, in the Zend framework uh, directory, there's, um, in the feeds directory, um, there's a pub sub hubbub implementation. And that's another published subscribe. That has more to do with RSS feeds, if I understand. But that's like instant updates, too. Like, that's a published subscribe model in the same way that MQTT is. So I would like to explore that a little further. That was like the most promising thing that I found. But it was um, not something that I, I learned too many things. So I had to stop, <laughs> take a breath. <laughs> Any other questions? Great. Well, thank you all for your attention. Thanks for coming. I really appreciate it.